Good morning. Let me just. There we go. How are you? What a lovely day. It's going to be 25, 28, 30 degrees somewhere in the next few days. It's Friday morning. <coughs> I don't work Friday afternoon. I know it's a bit of a cliche, the dentist not working on a Friday afternoon. Everyone assumes we're up the golf course, but I'm not. So I don't uh, play golf. Decided when I was a young dentist, I wasn't gonna fall into that cliche. Talking of uh, dentistry, I was up the dentist yesterday. I had my final bit of work done. Had a porcelain bonded crown on upper right six and a filling of restoration MO upper right seven. So, funnily enough, the restoration was done in amalgam by a guy who's a lecturer in restorative dentistry. So I presume he's uh, still doing amalgams because the NHS, that's all they'll pay for is amalgam and so I suppose they got this historical uh, hangover whereby they have to teach their students how to do amalgams, which is, you know, really antiquated, I would say, nowadays. I just happen to have found the only restorative dentist of any decent calibre in the southeast who's got a fetish for amalgam. So, you know, but what can you do? What can you say? He says, I'm going to do an amalgam, and you say, well, you know, you do whatever's best. You have to contract the clinical decisions to a dentist when he's treating you and I suppose in a way I'd rather have a, a amalgam restoration that's very high quality in terms of its technical detail than a than a white filling which might not be uh, you know so durable and let's face it you can it's an upper right seven so really what can you see of it Although the guy, the technician who made the upper right six crown said that the colour from the upper right seven will affect the upper right six. But then we're talking about the, you know, extreme degrees of hypothetical when you get to that point. And uh, certainly I don't think it seems to have made that much difference. Anyway, I'm getting my teeth to be quite a nice shade of C1 which is uh, the colour that they ended up after they were whitened and it's now become my my colour. Although I never really liked C. Would have preferred an A or a B, but C is all right. D's nicer, I like D better. You have to be a dentist to appreciate all this. So, yeah, anyway, and it all went really well, so. I mean, he's more expensive than I am, so you get a financial caning every time you go. And it's funny, you know, you, know, <laughs> you get no uh, concession at all to the fact that you're a member of the profession, a colleague, either in appointment times or, <coughs> excuse me, or, uh, or cost, you know. And that's quite, that's across the board. I mean, I've been to many different dentists and uh, nobody charges you anything less or treats you any differently just because you're a colleague which I find I do find odd because I don't I have a rule that I don't charge colleagues for their dentistry I charge them for their lab work but not you know the actual cost of doing because I think it's a privilege I think it's a uh, a compliment when someone in your profession comes to you to have the work done because I think what they're doing is they're saying that, you know, I know quite a few dentists and I've sussed them all out and of them all, I think you're the best fit for the sort of work that I need. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, the dentists take the compliment, but they don't give anything back in return. So anyway, that's neither here nor there, but that's just, it's just a major difference between the way I work. I personally, I think, 
you know, and, and dentists, some dentists do come to me for uh, treatment, and I'd like to think that you know we prioritise them because um, in return, if I was to need them to do something for me on an urgent basis, then they would prioritise me. But um, you know, apparently that's not the way they think. They're just like you know. Well, I've got you know. It's the old, it's the old-fashioned sort of attitude that a successful dentist is booked up two weeks ahead. But a really, really successful dentist, you can't get an appointment for three months. You know, that's on the face of it. Is you know, as I would say, a successful dentist is booked up two days ahead, and a really, really disorganised dentist who's hopeless at uh, working efficiently is booked up two weeks and and really someone who's completely lost control and just turns up for work and to deal with the emergencies every day is booked up three months ahead. Which I mean you know I mean you can get appointments next week with me you probably could just about we are probably routinely booking into two weeks ahead. Well, we had somebody ring yesterday who uh, said they've got a Ukrainian refugee, and and he was sort of a, he was like you know we're trying to get her an appointment. She's got toothache. We're trying to get her in on the NHS. They can't give her an appointment till September. They've given her antibiotics, which is just what they do to everybody now. I mean, God knows what antibiotic sensitivity is going to be like. Everybody in the country with a dental problem has had antibiotics. That uh, Jenny, was it Jenny Pinder? No. Su Su Susan Sanderson or something. Something Sanderson. The uh, BDA was in charge of uh, their anti-prescribing strategy where they told dentists to only prescribe antibiotics when they absolutely needed to. Uh, and now... Uh, that you know, policy was just conveniently forgotten uh, because at a time when all the NHS could do was prescribe antibiotics, then that was all they did. So you know, this if we find there's a large increase in uh, infections because of antibiotic over prescribing, but they they never will. You know, it was always a theoretical problem and needed to be dealt with by other means. Someone needs to come up with a very cheap and easy uh, test for a penicillin allergy uh, that can be applied to everybody who says that they're allergic to penicillin and uh, so that they can then, when it's proved that they're not, can they can then have penicillin instead of all these more um, exotic antibiotics that really should be kept in reserve. So anyway, this guy said, you know, can you, you know, we thought, we thought we'd sort of, we'd look in the private sector because the NHS sector in effect has let, let us down. So I said, yeah, you know, we could get her in tomorrow morning, which funnily enough, um, in the meantime, someone's actually booked up our emergency slot this morning. So we'll have to get her in at lunchtime, one o'clock. And but the girls weren't mind hanging on, I know, because I've got such tremendous loyalty from my staff to the extent where I gave them yesterday afternoon off while I went to the dentist and um, one of them in particular has decided to hang on and do a bit of painting and, and repaint part of the surgery. So that's, you can't buy that sort of uh, dedication to the, uh, to the, to the business. So I'm, I have no trouble at all that they'll hang on for half an hour while I sort out this Ukrainian woman who I hope can speak some English or is going to come in with a translator or something but this bloke is like oh yes we've got her in one of our houses in Ramsgate I'm like really you know what does that mean is, it, is he a represent a housing association is he a private landlord who's 
putting refugees in his private housing stock to pay his mortgages. You know, there's a lot of irony here. There's the, uh, the most obvious irony is that uh, a refugee not being able to get dental treatment on the NHS is almost certainly because the NHS is overloaded with refugees. Um, certainly in Ramsgate it is because Ramsgate is one of the receiving areas for the thousand or so people who cross the channel every day and uh, are still arriving and probably will arrive in their thousands today because the weather's going to be nice and the uh, sea's flat calm etc etc but anyway that, that's not going to interfere with the uh, medical treatment we'll deal with the uh, toothache the best we can So, yeah, so I've got three new patients coming in today. The, um, my dental treatment's finished now. My, all my teeth have got cracked and I have never had any decay, but um, all my fillings, amalgam fillings were done in the late 70s early late 70s so they're all getting to the end of their useful career now so I'm having them replaced the ones that are broken anyway and you sort of uh, if you have a lot of dentistry done you do get more used to it you know you get more relaxed about lying on your back with your mouth open with and not panicking about your airway getting compromised etc etc I wouldn't say it's a big deal, you know, having your teeth done. I mean, <laughs> it's like uh, when you uh, do some drilling in someone's mouth, and especially with a slow handpiece, and you say, look, you know, I'm going to use a different drill now. It's going to make a, make a, a bit of a, there's a bit of a vibration, you know, get ready for a, it's going to sound a bit different. This, this drill is like, you can't really overstate how much noise this thing makes. I mean, it's literally like World War Three going off in your head. Who's using a number six rosehead drill? And honestly, I felt like I put my fingers in my ears. It was so noisy, and it makes such an unpleasant, harsh, rattling, scraping, squeaking noise that. <clears throat> You can't really prepare people for dental treatment. I think the only way that you can sort of even get empathise with, with the treatment is to have it done yourself on a regular basis because uh, the injections, for example, I find are not a big deal at all, at all. Even the palatal injection is like, is mildly uncomfortable, nothing more than that. The uh, high-pitched turbine is is unpleasant because I think he's using uh, tungsten carbide bars, not possibly not diamonds. So you get this very, very high shrieking, and then secondly, you um, the slow hand piece is just the worst of the lot. It's just absolutely shocking, and uh, I can understand why people don't like that. I I don't like that. I personally, I don't care about it. I'm able to just put it to the back of my mind and say, look this too shall pass uh, and at the end of the day I'm going to get a great feeling out of it but you know I, I'm very close to saying to people if you're going to have a feeling just bring some headphones or something bring some earbuds <coughs> and that you can just stick in your ears so you can listen to some music because really you don't want to you know you, you're there for an hour you've got all these horrible screechy noises to listen to and absolutely nothing to look at apart from the dentist's hairy ear holes. So, it's not, you know, we could, we could possibly make it a bit better, I think, the experience, the whole dental experience, especially fillings and things like that. Uh, there are things that could be done to mitigate it, let's put it that way. I mean, uh, and, it, and certainly I've, uh, you know, been to talks by dentists who said don't use don't use slow handpiece because it's 
un- so unpleasant that really people are going to people hate it and you can always use an air rotor the argument being that you don't want to use an air rotor because an air rotor is like a lightsaber and it cuts through everything whereas a slow hand piece will arguably not really cut through enamel but will remove uh, dentine and particular disease dentine but it does it at the expense of a lot of uh, crashing and banging which you know I'm sure puts people off having restorative work. More in the upper jaw. I mean, in the lower jaw, you don't really have that direct connection between the uh, drill and the and the eardrum. Whereas in the upper jaw, you do. There's no uh, TMJ for the noise to go through. Sorry, you have to go in a minute. There's no gap for you on your side. Anyway, I'm actually I'm up to date now on all the videos. I've posted about 11 videos in the last month, going right back to February. I mean, it's funny because to see the February ones, everything's really soaking wet, and uh, and you know I'm saying things like, "Oh, it's raining today, and it's forecast to rain for the week," and yet today here we are in July, and it's really really hot and sunny today, and it's forecast to remain hot and sunny for the week. So you tend to forget the extremes in the temperatures. I must say I prefer the hot and sunny than I do the uh, the week of rain or the strong winds we get. So we might as well enjoy it while I can. Anyway, those of you who know my route will know that I'm, I'm at work now, so uh, I can't think of anything else to say. So, in the interest of brevity, I shall sign off, and uh, I might talk to you next week. Okay, bye for now.